My name is Stephanie Hoffman and we are here with Sarah and Dave Spector at Bells Up Winery. It is June 19th and um, we're just going to start this interview off with why wine? <laughs> well, I, I think that both of us have always had a, had a passion for, for drinking it um, and that started really for me um, at a in my mid-twenties. I had a lot of friends that were older and were uh, very into it and so that kind of helped me to get along kind of faster than I think normally it would. Um, we never though as far as producing it you know we never even really started thinking about it until we got sort of into our mid-30s. Yeah. We were happy consumers. <laughs> yeah. um, but, and go ahead. Well I was gonna say that's what we started making wine in 2006 um, in our basement in Cincinnati um, and uh, it was our five-year anniversary cute coupley thing to do <laughs> um, so I bought a wine kit um, and signed us up for a home winemaking class and um, we started making wine um, and I thought it was really fun to make the labels and drink it and Dave just got fascinated with wow I use this yeast it does this I use that yeast it does that this is just an amazing process and it creates something tangible um, Dave was a corporate tax attorney um, doing mergers and acquisitions uh, for a major accounting firm um, and I've been a freelance marketing consultant for a couple of decades now at this point um, and we just really got interested in making wine and he really got interested in making wine and so it started to take over the house. Um, I think most people that are <laughs> for winemakers will tell you it, it's a hobby that gets out of control right. very quickly. Yeah. I say I might be the only married man who uh, increased their space in the house for their hobby as time went right. on. Yep, yep, took over the basement and then the garage and then the whole house. Um, so we started taking wine vacations um, because suddenly this was our passion and our hobby. Um, and we wound up here um, in the Willamette, um, in Newburgh actually in 2008. Um, and we stayed at Shehalem Ridge Bed and Breakfast, which is literally 400 feet up the side of Shehalem Mountain from our property. Um, and you know when you're on vacation you're always like oh I could totally live here and I remember saying to Dave we're gonna live here we're gonna get property on um, Bell Road we're gonna get um, a, you're gonna be a winemaker we're gonna have a vineyard this is what we're gonna do in 20 years and Dave said yeah 20 years sounds about right because we were living suburban dream in Cincinnati that's not what you know normal people don't chuck it all in their 30s and and start a winery and so we came back from that vacation um, and my mentor called me uh, two weeks later and she had just turned 40 um, and was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer um, and she had a nine-year-old son and six-year-old twin girls uh, and she died 10 months later and so as I was watching her get sicker and sicker um, and sicker our daughter was born um, and we are adoptive parents and so we brought her home uh, right before Christmas of 2008 and then Dave they were pushing Dave to make partner um, and giving him more and more and more work and um, he just kind of finally had a nervous breakdown, basically. It was just too much. And I remember in January of 2009, looking at him and looking at our baby and looking at my mentor and saying, this is ridiculous. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Um, you know, we don't even, why are we trying to keep up with the Joneses? We don't even like the Joneses. This is just not, not what life is about. And I said to Dave, if you're this successful, doing something that makes you really miserable and sick and unhappy, then how much more successful would you be if you were doing something you love and you really love making wine? Um, so um, we decided that he would take a year leave of absence from his job um, and they were very generous and let him do that. Um, and we went around to all the wineries in Cincinnati, all six of them, um, <laughs> and asked if anybody would take him on to learn the business as a professional. Uh, and one gentleman did. He worked for an urban winery um, called Hanky Winery. Um, and uh, it, the gentleman that ran it was very much um, a hobbyist turned professional. Uh, they made 2,000 cases of wine um, annually out of the basement of a 100-year-old house on the west side of Cincinnati. Um, and it was very bare bones, back to basics winemaking, no expensive toys, nothing fancy about it, no gravity fed anything. Um, the, the ceilings were eight feet tall. There were spots where you had to watch your head. It was, it was really, <laughs> really, really the best place in the world 
to learn how to do this as a pro and Joe was very generous with his time and with what he shared and I mean it was open book it was you know I'll show you the good the bad and the ugly I want you to know what you're getting into um, and so that's what Dave did for three years um, and then in 2011 um, he he'd continued making wine in our basement in 2011, he uh, entered and won two different amateur national winemaking competitions with two different wines in the space of two months. And I said, oh, there's our sign. Um, as Dave said, that's our sign that my wine doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> and so we felt like, okay, that's, that's it, that we're on the right path. Um, so we put the house on the market. It took a year to sell it. And exactly, just about exactly five years ago today, we moved here. Um, so yeah, so, and then this property, um, we were very fortunate. It was not um, listed, but we were able to um, basically network our way to it and um, negotiate an off-market sale. And yeah, that's how we wound up here, starting to make wine. So, awesome. Um, so, why did you guys decide? I know you stayed in Newburgh whenever you guys came here mm -hmm. on vacation, but did you guys look at other places in the Willamette Valley or just in Oregon in general? Why did you guys decide <laughs> here? We, we knew we wanted to be in Oregon. Yeah, um, and also we understood that the balance of our lives was going in such a way that with a child we needed to be relatively close to civilization. Yeah. So to speak. <laughs> I mean, there are some places that are wonderful winemaking places but mm -hmm. that are very far out and you know if you have to drive 20 minutes to get milk that kind of makes it difficult. So in some ways, you know, we understood we were looking for a needle in a haystack as far as property goes. Mm -hmm. um, something that had vineyard potential but that wasn't too far away um, and we were just very very lucky to be in the right place at the right time and when we networked to these folks we hit them at the exact spot um, when they were ready to move they had six children the last one was graduating high school and so they were ready to make a change in their lives as well and yeah. um, you know we we were just very very lucky yeah we love the Shahala mountains I, it's just beautiful the spot mm -hmm. is just incredibly beautiful and I, I remember you know like I said when we were 400 feet higher we were just blown away by how gorgeous um, this view is from here um, and and I just I was like I want this view this is incredible and so yeah we feel so lucky um, that that this worked out the way it did um, the other thing was we knew we wanted it to just be the two of us um, and so the further south you go, the parcels start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, I remember people trying to convince us that, you know, five acres probably wasn't wasn't going to be big enough, but ten acres might be a little too much. And we have ten acres, and there are days when I think well, this is a little too much <laughs> for two people. So says the one who never says the one who the doesn't on the tractor. No, no, I don't do the tractor, but but yeah. You know, I'd say the other thing is the industry itself. I mean, one of the things we knew from our visit here, just, just going around to a lot of these smaller non-commercial wineries, it just felt home for us. It, it's kind of hard to put into words, but the people who own these places and who work in the tasting rooms were some of the most warm, welcoming folks. And it was just something that was unusual for us when we thought about, you know, compared it to some other areas where they're bigger, more corporate, um, and you know just we, we wanted to create a very home-like feel with our winery and as you went around to places around here that's really where we felt like we were fitting right in mm -hmm. um, and we I believe had just kind of had that feeling that over time we were going to bond very well with the industry and, and I think fortunately in, in the time that we spent in we've done a pretty good job of that yeah. yeah. How? Oh, what Go was ahead. It, sorry. What was it like getting into the industry um, as a new winery um, with some of these more established wineries yeah. for 20, 30, 40 years have been around? What was it like um, joining that group? Well, I think the biggest thing was, you know, we understood we had to establish some credibility. Yeah. And so, you know, there are, I, I think there are a number of ways to do that. I, in our case, I think we just kind of came in and were honest. You know, we said, look, we we know enough about the business to know that it's a ton of work it was going to be very you know unromantic stuff mm -hmm. we were willing to do that hard work and we were willing to listen um you know one of the good things i think about coming from an amateur winemaking background is that you don't come in with the ego to think that you know all the answers i don't we're learning stuff every day um and i think that's one of the reasons people have sort of bonded with us because we 
we talk about our mistakes. We, yeah. we talk about the lumps. Um, and the reason we do that is because other people in this industry have been so wonderful to share their experiences with us, yeah. the good and the bad. I don't think that happens just anywhere. Uh, I think this place is special for that. You know, folks come in and once they realize that you're serious, they want to see you succeed. Um, they want to see you fit in as a part of the industry and they're, you know, as I always say, it's like once you establish you're not a jerk, it's an amazing how many people will go out of their way to help you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in this spot, we've been very fortunate to have some wonderful uh, friends in the industry, you know, from within just a five to ten minute drive. Mm -hmm people that have been very supportive, have helped to push customers to us early, um, people that were sounding boards for us in planting the vineyard and in getting going. Um, you know, I think we've just tried to establish that we were here to do things honestly and, you know, we, we this wasn't a vanity project for us, this was a passion thing and, and I think that's that's been respected. I would say also we um, were pretty voracious networkers. Um, and so from the beginning, I think when we were still in Cincinnati, um, Dave was connected to um, Myron Red Redford, Redford um, of Amity Vineyards. Um, and Dave happened to be out here at one point and set up a meeting with him and it, they wound up chatting for what? Four, About three hours. Three and, hours. And, yeah, and just, uh, he, they were an open book. Um, yeah. And it was just amazing. I still have a, you know, seven eight pages worth of notes taken from that right. meeting and you know again just just somebody who was very open and honest about you know what his mistakes were and what his successes yeah. were and with <clears throat> great advice and you know things that we've certainly taken to heart to help us get set up and you know and there were pe a lot of people like that, that were in that vein too just just like mm -hmm. Myron um, mm -hmm. willing to share that knowledge and insight mm -hmm. and and really have a passion for the Oregon wine industry and you know, Myron was kind of getting to the end of, of his time in the industry and I think, you know, is looking forward to saying, hey, I've got the next generation that's coming in and we want to see them pick up the mantle of what, you know, folks yeah. like him laid down and run with it. Yeah, but but coming in and asking a lot of questions, you mm -hmm. know, Dave and I both, our backgrounds and is are more business um, and we, neither of us, you know, maybe it's because we're we moved here from the Midwest. I don't know, but we we never approach this like we knew everything. Um, we don't. We aren't those people who say, "Oh, yes, we just innately know how to make wine and we have the answer to everything." Um, we often will go and ask people. You know, we don't know what we don't know, so please tell us what you know. What what did you? What was your biggest mistake, and how can we learn from it? And you know, what was the most successful thing you did, and what can we learn from it? And we've been very. Um, aggressive and, and some people are very passionate about you know this is what I did I screwed up you guys like this was bad and mm -hmm. and then they, they get kind of like fired up about it and then they'll be like oh but I'm sorry you know you might want to do it that way and that's okay we're like no no we want to know mm -hmm. what you did wrong because we don't want to repeat your mistake yeah. like thank you and thank you for telling us you know so I think that's been you know a lot of what when we do things we don't you know we ask people but the other thing that we do is we take that advice and we do it um, and I remember um, you know, we, we've worked with Mark and Tina Hammond, who are two doors away at Prefay Vineyard, and I remember initially we came, we, we were introduced to them, and we sat down with them, and we explained what we wanted to do, and um, we had a list of questions, and they were kind and generous, and they gave us a lot of time, and they answered all the questions, and, um, and we went away, and I called them back three months later, and I said, okay, I have some more questions, can we take you out to lunch? And they were like, oh, okay, sure. So we took them out to Jory, um, and we had a long lunch, and, and, you know, we're sitting there, and I said, okay, so you told us to do this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and so we did this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and so now we have questions about that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and they just sat there and looked at us, like, and we said, what? What did we do? And they said, you're the first people that have ever done everything we've told you to do. Like, we've <laughs> gone through this conversation so many times. And you guys actually went and did it. And we said, well, yeah, because we want to be like you guys when we grow up. We want to do, we want to be, you know, we love your model. That's what we want to do. And that's, you know, why wouldn't we do what you told us to do? Like, uh, uh, you know, if somebody tells you that and takes the time, why wouldn't you do it? So I think that really, when Dave says established credibility, I think that really went a long way toward um, being accepted and, you know, among, as, as outsiders. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's been one of the things we really appreciate from people too. If they're gonna yeah. tell us how to do it, we're gonna do it. So, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, what does the name Bells Up mean? And um, why did you guys choose it? Mm -hmm. 
So I, I should say to begin with, Bells Up was was my name and my suggestion. And the marketing department <laughs> hated at it. First hated it. <laughs> Not anymore. You don't. Well, <laughs> I have um, my moments. <laughs> it has grown on me, mm -hmm. just like you did. <laughs> just like a fungus. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was a French horn player for about 20 years and I wanted to tie the music theme in and um, she was on me for years before we had the property. She wanted to come up with a name that she could market and I, I kept saying, you know, the name will come when we find the property because, you know, we're, with our luck, you know, we'll have this name in mind and then somehow something about the property will end up not making any sense with the name. Right. And, um, but I wanted to tie the music theme in because I wanted to honor that part of my history. Um, I started playing when I was in junior high and I played all the way through college. I was in symphonies and ensembles. I, I was a really good player, but I, I wasn't anywhere near good enough to have a career in it, and I knew it. But I also knew, you know, I, I also have these such wonderful memories and experiences from my playing days. I mean, I got to do things that most people couldn't dream of because I played and I wanted to honor that time um, and even though I, I really don't play anymore I just I just don't have time to practice anymore but I, I wanted to honor that um, and so when we ended up with this property on Bell Road um, it just clicked and I knew exactly how to how to tie it in and so what bells up means normally when you're playing the the horn um, the bell of the horn uh, called the business end, uh, sits on your leg and you play uh, with your left hand, you play with the valves up here. But you get this moment every once in a while where the composer wants to create this very dramatic effect. So in the score of the horn part, it'll say bells up and at this point the music's getting louder and crescendoing and then you'll see as an observer, you'll see the horn players lift their bells in the air and this is just kind of their moment for dramatic and to play out and, and to really be expressive. and. For me, it felt like with all the blood, sweat, and tears, and all those things are literal in the case of winery, uh, that go into creating a place like this um, and fulfilling a dream, uh, that it was, it was our time, it was really our time to play out and to express and to shine. And so I think it fit perfectly with, you know, kind of our, it's very personal. Um, and it also ties in, I think, very well with our wines. And it's, it's something that, you know, it's great that people ask about it. And everybody that comes in asks about it, unless they're already musicians, in which case they already know, and yeah. um, which is cool too. But you know, we we didn't want to have, we didn't want to have kind of a run-of-the-mill name. I think those things are easily forgettable. Um, we were also told by the uh, by Kristen, the bed and breakfast owner uh, that we stayed at, that. Yeah, don't name it after yourselves, your kids, your dog, and, yeah. and she was right. Um, you know, I mean, all those things have kind of been done, and like I say, they become easily forgettable. Um, but when you have something like this, it causes people to ask, and you know, it's part of our story, and people seem to bond with that, so that's great. It's also gotten us a lot of attention from uh, symphony players across the country. Um, you know, for all the bad things about social media, social media has been a huge part of our uh, of our brand development. I mean, we've gotten just unsolicited calls for, for wine orders from, you know, bat Minnesota, New York, Georgia, people that are professional players that, you know, have had pictures shared or, you know, somehow have heard about us and didn't realize that there was this unmet need for this symphony-themed winery, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's a need that we're more than happy to fill. Yeah. Um, so, what are each of your roles here at Bells Up, and how did you guys kind of decide them? You kind of talked about like how winemaking was your mm -hmm. passion, but what are the other things? Because so much goes into making wine and selling it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Sarah's, Sarah's the marketer. Yes, I'm the marketing department, and and um, I do about everything else. <laughs> well, yeah, that's probably true. I'm also, I'm the I'm the one who pays the mortgage, um, but the winery. Um, you know, our goal was to stay small um, and be stuff that we could do without having really any sort of full-time staff. We have occasional, um, we have a, a great friend who comes in and helps us a few hours a week, um, but doesn't want to be full-time, so that's been great. Um, but when it comes down to making all the decisions and making the wine, um, we have a consulting winemaker as well. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I do. I do the marketing, and then when it's harvest, I'm out there on the sorting line too. Um, I pop in during 
some blending trials and tastings, but you know, I mostly and you, take and you pictures. Help when we have larger, when we have <laughs> yeah. larger groups, well, yeah. groups of, oh, yeah. you know, above eight, um, and we I need an pour. extra hand to pour, then yeah. it, it helps, Sarah helps move things All along. But, house things, um, yeah, but mostly it's Dave's, this is Dave's show. I mean, I'm here, um, I think people associate both of us with the winery, and I'm, it's not that I'm not involved a lot uh, because I am but um, but yeah I mean Dave's the one that makes all the winemaking decisions and um, it, it, you know it, I don't really have a whole lot you know you make the pick decisions you um, do all the tasting through and mm -hmm. he always invites me to come up and taste through and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. <laughs> not, not that we listen to what she Not says. that he listens <laughs> to what I say anyway. It's, I think it's just being courteous. I don't think it has anything to do with my opinion. Um, but, but Well, I've got to listen to your opinion. Yeah, like everything, else, everything yeah. else. So I've got to, I've that's, got to that's, get that's my his say one thing. somewhere. Yeah, that's just one thing he's allowed to have. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I think and technically, um, you know, we, we we make some joint decisions with regard to the vineyard um, and things like that. But I would say, you know, Dave's probably 85 to 90 percent of the decisions are what he thinks is best. He's done, um, you know, in addition to being an amateur, he did go and do um, the the one year uh, vineyard program at Chemeketa, which I'm not going to get the name of it right, but you, you did the yeah. year there, yeah. and then he had done a distance enology winemaking program at Washington State, which was like an 18, 19 month right. program. So he did go along the way and get some additional um, education, more formal, um, as well as worked in a retail wine shop and mm -hmm. did some other wine related um, But we've also, things, we've brought in people to yeah. work with us to be partners yes. that that are very experienced. I mean, we have a vineyard manager that he yeah. and his family, you know, they've been doing this for right. you know, 20 so years. Yeah. And we we work together, but certainly, you know, it's his area of expertise. Right. I know enough to be able to have intelligent conversations. We talk about, you know, what we want to accomplish. Um, and then, you know, I there's, there's only so much I can have my hands on, so he's responsible for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then Sarah mentioned our consulting winemaker, Erica. Mm -hmm. She's wonderful. She's second generation. Mm -hmm. uh, her father owns a, another winery, uh, Adia Winery, over in Gaston. Mm -hmm. um, and she's been absolutely wonderful as an idea person, as a mm -hmm. sounding board. Mm -hmm. She really keeps us from doing anything dumb. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And and that's important. And I you know it's like I say, as we always say, you know, we you know we think we're you know we're we do pretty good at this, but we you, everybody needs oh, yeah. some help. Everybody needs to have that that person that kind of helps you, you know, keep just kind of stay centered and and stay keep you on the path. And she's done great with mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even I'll I'll even go to her and say, what about this? You know, because I'm thinking from a sales or marketing perspective and. And you know she'll be like, okay, yeah, we can do that. We'll 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 keep that in mind. I'll make sure we, you know, th like for example, we're finally going to have our first harvest this um, this fall of our oldest vines, and we're planning to make rosé. Um, but I had said to both Dave and Erica, could we try to get maybe like a carboy's worth of just straight Pinot from each of the clones, just to see what we've got. You know, just as an experiment, really. Not that we would bottle or sell it, but more like let's just see. And yeah, Erica was like, yeah, we can do that. That's a good idea. And, you know, so it'll be kind of. It'll be fun. So yeah, she's she's definitely um, been a great resource and you know a sanity check. I think a lot of times. Um, so. I don't think you can do something like this without help. I mean, yeah. I, I I don't think that you know for for people coming in, but I think that's part of it too. I, I think it's you know part of being successful at this is surrounding yourself with people that are really good at certain things and letting them do their jobs and listening to them and. You know, there, there, are, like I say, there are things that we're really good at, but but we're not really good at everything. Um, and you know, it, it helps to have those other folks come in and supplement where we, you know, aren't maybe quite there on our own yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for you, and you guys have different answers. Um, what's the what's the most important part um, when it comes to making good wine? Does it start in the vineyard? Is it with the winemaking? Like what? part of it makes good wine. <laughs> I really do think that it starts in the vineyard. Um, and, and we learned that up close and personal in our very first harvest in 2013. Um, you know, one of the things we love about Oregon Pinot Noir is that every year tells the story of the season um, through the vintage. And 2013, you know, our first year, the year's going along okay. We get to September. 
and it starts dumping buckets of rain on us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're kind of having these looks. You're driving through other vineyards and you're getting, you know, so you go by some of these places and you're just getting the smells of just molding and rotting grapes, that this vinegary, ugh, disgusting. Mm -hmm. And But the thing was, all through these rains, we kept going back to our source vineyards. Um, and we source from very, very small vineyards, um, the local, but, you know, people that don't, have a whole lot of space. I mean, five acres and under. Um, people that live on the property, and as it turns out, you know, we we kind of stumbled into this answer. But when you deal with farmers like that, they are going to be on their maintenance programs throughout the season, in June, July, and August. Um, things where if you if you let your spray program slip, if you don't, you know, pick you know pull leaves and and thin out the fruit when you're supposed to do it you set yourself up for disaster if the weather turns sideways on you. Um, and yeah, it does happen in Oregon occasionally where the weather goes sideways on you in September. So there were a lot of people that lost a lot of crop in, in, in 2013. There were people I know that didn't make 2013 vintage. Um, when the pickers came to pick our grapes in early October, they were astonished at how clean our fruit was from both of our vineyard sources. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that saved that vintage. We really didn't have an option. That was our first vintage yeah. and failure was not an option and we had to run with what we had. Mm -hmm. um, and our growers made that possible. Mm -hmm. So as a winemaker, frankly, my job is two things. One is, uh, you know, to find people that can help us to get clean, ripe, wonderful flavored grapes um, that are healthy and strong and good to go. And then my job as a winemaker primarily becomes about not screwing it up, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I become a caretaker for all of the hard work that they've done out there. Um, and it's about, for me, it's about doing very simple things but doing them consistently and doing them well. It's just keeping things clean, keeping your yes. barrels topped. Um, as you're going through your ferments, you know, you're going through them as you normally do and you're testing and you're smelling, you're kind of doing all those things and looking for issues as they develop and dealing with them right away. Um, you know, just, just the little simple things of, of keeping areas clean, you know, things that never really get talked about with the general public. But I think anybody in the industry will tell you, you know, as winemakers, that's probably about 90% of what we do. Um, and it really pays off. You know, I hear our style referred to as very clean, very elegant, and, and it's all those things that make it possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. we're, we're on the same page on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I also think that's, that's the Oregon way, too. Um, you know, I think one of the important things, you know, we, we've always kind of tried to figure out what's different about the, the wine industry here versus, you know, California. And one of the things, the biggest thing, I think, is that I think this area is still very much farm focused um, versus wine winery focused. And so, you know, farmers as a general rule will collaborate and cooperate because nobody, no farmer wants to see another farmer fail. Right. Um, and I think that's the biggest difference. You know, we, we've had a little bit of corporate uh, money come in and, and there's a little bit of, you know, the vanity project, but nowhere near what it is in California. Yeah. And I really think that the heart of this area comes down to that the people that started this industry um, and their families are focusing on farming first. And so I think with, if that's the case, we're always going to be different from California, always going to be different from anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Right. Um, so what are some of the challenges of being a small boutique winery? <laughs> I'd say one of the first ones is getting people to know you exist. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there, the the industry is great about referring other customers and being helpful, but the reality is, you know, as we're sitting here today, there are just in the Willamette Valley about 500 other wineries. By the time this goes out, that number will probably double. Um, that's really where Sarah has done a ton of work. Yeah. Um, you know, with with social media, with networking, um, just kind of trying to figure out what are the ways that we're going to be able to get people to come in the door. I mean, I, I believe that once we come in the door, once people come in the door, you know, the wines and the views and kind of all those things can speak for themselves. I don't really even need to get in the way that much. Right. 
but it's it's getting the attention of people that you know have a lot of other choices yeah. um, and have their existing favorites and getting them to take a chance yeah, yeah. I would agree um, you know the other reason we're small again Dave and I bring a business background to this both of us um, you know, he has a in addition to a law degree he has a bachelor's in business and an MBA as well and over educated he's under way over educated <laughs> yeah totally um, over degreed um, but for us when we did this one of the first things we said and, and Dave particularly um, is we don't make a lot because we don't anticipate being able to sell a whole lot in the beginning. So um, we're 300 to 400 cases a year. Um, and the difference is, do we make a white wine or not? Um, a straight white, like a Blanc, a Pinot Blanc. Um, so that's the difference between 300 and 400 cases. Um, the sum total of our production is right now, what, 16 barrels in? Oh, less. oh well, yes. Right yeah, now, there's about 16 barrels in there yes, right now. Um, that's it. Um, and. For us, it's not. It's about not making more than we can sell, um, and you know we. That's been a really. Um, I guess I don't know. I don't want to pat ourselves on the back too it's much. It's been a but challenge to the dis to discipline. You yeah, know, one thing. Right, um, but it's smart strategy business wise. Mm -hmm. Like we don't. You know, we we're always amazed at brand new labels that come out with fifteen hundred cases, and we're like, wow, who are you selling to, and can you send them to us because that's awesome. <laughs> you know, we don't we don't do. We're in awe of anybody who does that because it's like, wow. Yeah. You have so much more money than we do, but yeah. Well, everything we sell is is out of here. Right. I mean, there are a few exceptions to that. I mean, a restaurant or two, uh, and a wine shop or two, but but those are the yeah. those are very much exceptions to what we do right. ninety nine percent of the time. I mean, we have always believed that the way to survive long term is to establish great relationships with your customers, right. and I think the only way to do that is to have the personal touch and the personal connection. Yeah. Um, you know, Sarah is always uh, known for saying that, you know, everything we do is high touch. Um, you know, our website, for example, isn't even set up to take orders directly. No. You know, it tells you what the wines are, but you're going to have to call me or email me and we're actually going to have to have a conversation, darn it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I, I think that that is very important. It can get very impersonal if you let it. And when things are impersonal, I think that's encourage encourages folks to, you know, go billions of other places. Whereas I think once you bond and get to know somebody on the production side, you're far more likely to come back and hopefully bring your friends and family and coworkers and all that. And, and hopefully, you know, we can make those things happen right. over time. Right. You know, it takes longer right. um, and it's a lot more work um, and, and it is a grind to keep doing this over and over. You know, every time somebody new comes through the door, you're, you're telling your story over right. and over <laughs> and, you know, and it, we love sharing it, but kind of like anything else, you know, it's how do you keep your pitch, for lack of a better word, from getting stale when you yeah. tell it. And that's hard. You know, we struggle with that sometimes. Yeah. And you have those days, you know, when you're on your fourth appointment of the day and you're like, I'm so happy we're having people coming in the door. And on the other hand, my voice is about to die on yeah. me and I yeah. just want to go take a nap. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the thing. Now, the hope is that all of this time will, over the long run, you know, we'll be able to kind of get more and more and we can do more sort of personal chatting with our guests as opposed to, you know, storytelling and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, build relationships that way. But I, I would say that's the thing. I mean, there's a cost to building those relationships, mm -hmm. but, you know, from what we see in the long run, we think that that's for us yeah. the best right. model. Right. And yeah. um, it'll, I think, put us in a bet much better yeah. position as time goes on. I mean, again, we didn't want to have employees. Um, you know, I've worked for myself long enough. I've worked for other people too, but I've worked for myself long enough to know that, no, thank you. I, I didn't want to manage people. Um, I have a husband to manage and that's plenty. Um, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, we, and, and Dave, I think, you know, felt the same way. I mean, he came from corporate America and he saw what it was like and he just, you know, he wanted to create something tangible and not have to deal with the headaches of, of managing a staff and having somebody else represent who you are and what you're trying to make with the wine. And so, yeah, for us, it's really, yes, we make wine. Yes, we have people come in and taste it by appointment. Yes, it's we're selling wine, but really what we build it around is the experience mm -hmm. um, that you have when you're here. Um, and that's really a whole lot more than just selling wine. 
um, because we want people to walk out of here and feel like they made a new friend um, and that happens to sell wine. Mm -hmm. that's, that's our goal. Um, so yeah, so we approach it a little bit differently. Um, but yes, it's working so far. So um, do you, is the goal to then get bigger? How big do you guys want to get? My absolute max, so as Sarah said, make about three to 400 now. Mm -hmm. We could, uh, over, the, over the time, we could do a little bit more than double that. Um, but there is a maximum, and I think for us that maximum is in the neighborhood of a thousand cases. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as far as growth, you know, and we get asked about this a ton. I mean, it, it is funny. I, I've seen people, you know, they'll, they'll have a really good year and they'll double production and then they'll struggle to sell. I'm like, no, no. As, you know, we'll go from, let's say, three to 400 to 350 to four. We're going to build very, yeah. very slowly mm -hmm. and bump up by, you know, maybe a barrel or by two. By the barrel, yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, it's you can make as much wine as you want, and if you can't sell it yeah. or sell nearly all of it, it doesn't really do you any good and yeah. creates more problems for you yeah. in the end. Um, and it has to always, you know, as we've been saying, it always has to be manageable for two people right. plus some friends and some part-time help. Um, you know, I, I look at our physical space and say, yeah, I mean, we could, you know, we'll have the ability to add a few more barrels here and there, and we can, you know, stack them up a little bit toward the ceiling. but. The building that we have is pretty much what the barrel room ever will be. Um, and that's, that's sort of where we want it to end. I mean, we don't want this to become just another business. Yeah. I mean, yes, financially it has to support itself and we want it to put it in that position. But from everything we've seen, um, it can do that without getting big size-wise. Um, and we don't want to have to look into national distribution. Yeah. I don't want to have to fly to New York and internationally to make sales to distributors. Um, you know, we're just not in the volume business. No. You know, I have no interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our, we're not high end or anything like that. I mean, we're by far, we're, we're, we're not the cheapest wines in the valley, but we're far from the most expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly where we want to be. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so, you know, just kind of when you put all that together, you know, that means that you really have to follow a very, very certain model and a very certain set of steps. Um, and it works for us, but that's the thing. I mean, I think you, you've got to have, you know, you've got to take that time and you've got to, you know, be willing to get down and, and spend all that real quality time with everyone that comes in the door. So is there anything, you kind of touched on this a little bit, is there anything else in the future for Belza? <laughs> well, probably the biggest thing is our, our uh, estate, estate vineyard, vineyard yeah. is going to be coming online. Yeah, that would be. Um, starting uh, this year, yep. uh, we're going to start with rosé. Um, I, I, there, I think the, the grape quality will be perfectly fine for rosé. I don't think we're going to be ready probably for about another two to possibly three years, but I hope it's only two, uh, <laughs> for an estate Pinot Noir program. But, but we'll get okay. there eventually. Um, the Saval Blanc is probably the most. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you tell them a little about can. that? Um, so we have what we believe to be the Willamette Valley's first planting and only planting of Saval Blanc. Um, That's S E Y V A L. Yeah, B L A N C. Um, and we believe also that it is the second planting in Oregon. With um, from what we can tell, the first one was um, in the 80s um, by Girardet down in Roseburg. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I believe they maybe have a, maybe an acre of it or a half acre. It's not, not very much. Um, but um, yeah, we, it was a grape that Dave worked with a lot um, in Ohio. It's um, a hybrid. Um, we don't have a lot planted, but we plant 250 vines or so. Um, and um, yeah, we, it, it, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, but really, we planted it because it tells our story um, yeah. very well from Cincinnati. Dave, it was one of the wines that Dave won one of his amateur um, national winemaking competitions with and we felt like it was a really good story and we also feel that um, it's important to have a little bit of diversification in the tasting room um, so whereas a lot of places are a 100% house of Pinot um, we absolutely love Oregon Pinot and what three of our typically three of our five wines are six. yeah are, um, are Pinot based um, we've also tried to have something a little bit different as well um, so we have been sourcing a Pinot Blanc, uh, which will eventually become the Saval Blanc. Um, and then um, we also make a Syrah from the Oregon side of um, Walla Walla. No, free water. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, we like to have a little something different um, in our tasting room uh, because not everybody 
wants to taste Pinot. And sometimes people come in and they say, oh, we're really Pinot'd out. You have something other than Pinot, it's in Kevin. So <laughs> yeah, we try, to, we try to be a little more um, varied and respectful of what people want. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of exciting. It, it is interesting though too, one of the things we're kind of trying to figure out, I think, is that we've seen, even just in the last couple of years, we've seen a shift in the market um, I think it used to be, you know, we, people used to come in and were just looking for Pinot. And now they're coming in looking for Pinot, yes, but for other things as well. I think they're looking to diversify their experience. So one of the things we're trying to figure out is, you know, how much do you get into making other wines? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's something that as an industry we've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, how, you know, if you're going to make another red or two or a series of whites, you know, kind of what's the right balance? Um, and for a small winery like ours, it doesn't make a whole lot of wine anyway. I think it's particularly challenging yeah. because you know you have to make enough to make it worthwhile, but at the same time you don't want to make too much and get caught with stuff that isn't selling. So, right. you know that's that's kind of something that we're watching and trying to we'll work our way through, and and you know eventually we'll figure that out. But the Blanc, we, the Saval Blanc we planted in 2015, um, so yep. we had really one really beautiful cluster last year, it was gorgeous. <laughs> um, so this year we're hoping for two. Now I, I think we'll have a little more this year, but I don't think it'll be enough to make any more than, again, maybe a carboy's worth if we're lucky, yep. just to see what we've got. Not for bottling, but, but we, we're hoping maybe next year, like yep. 18. We'll see. The, the Saval grape has Sauvignon Blanc parentage to it, and I've, I've often wondered why more Sauv Blanc isn't planted in this mm. area because I, I mean well, personally I've always loved it but it, it grows very well here and I I've never really understood maybe it's just because Chardonnay is getting getting back into fashion again I know Pinot Gris obviously is very popular um, but it does seem like there's a place for kind of these other white grapes mm -hmm. um, and it's the, the Saval is just an absolute it's full of flavor and just re there's a lot going on with it complexity wise too so that's going to be a lot of fun to bring forward you know and i, I think that's going to give us a pretty good lineup yeah. going forward yeah. Yeah. Okay. um as um <clears throat> new additions to the industry where do you think the oregon wine industry is going or and more particularly the willamette valley <laughs> Boy, that depends on the day and who you ask. It's 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 changing. <laughs> well, the last couple of years, things have changed quite a bit. Yes. Um, you know, you've seen now the uh, you know Kendall Jackson's come in and made some big time acquisitions, um, and you know that's that's kind of already having a trickle down effect on the rest of the industry. I, I certainly don't expect those acquisitions to stop, and I'm sure that um, other uh, other companies will try to get involved as well. Um, and you know it's interesting when you go around and you you talk to folks and there's you know there's a lot of hand wringing about it and you know kind of you know are we losing our way are we losing our soul um, you know I guess it, it depends on how you look at it you know on one hand bring, being corporate gets uh, it gets more notoriety to the area it allows some of these wines to get into retail establishments across the country that they may otherwise not um, on the other hand, it definitely changes when you go to the tasting room what the experiences are like. Right. Um, and from our perspective, since you know, as a small place, we're not really interested in competing with them for store uh, shelf space, so they don't really affect us there. Um, and you know, I, I don't think that the desire for a place like ours that's small and intimate and personal is ever going to change. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think if anything, the more corporate influence that comes and the, you know, the, the more ritzy some of these tasting rooms get, I, I really do think it will help us in the long run. Um, because I think at the end, people are, are going to want to come to a place where they feel like they can connect with the folks that are pouring the wines for them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's harder to do when you're, you know, in, when you're a corporation or when you're in just, you know, kind of an over the top marble palace. You know, I, I think it, uh, you know, I, I think it, it makes people long for something a little simpler and then that, that we can do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I I don't think I really have anything to add to that. I guess I, you know, I think it, in, from from a grape volume perspective, um, when we moved here in 2012, we had several people say to us, "Oh, you guys, you got to plant your own vineyard." Because originally we weren't even thinking about really having a. I mean, yes, it would be romantic to have a vineyard, but we weren't really thinking, "Oh, yeah, we need a vineyard to so that we have a source 
um, and um, because we were very familiar with the, mod the sourcing model. And, but when we moved here, we had so many people say, oh, grapes are, it's really hard to find grapes right now. Gosh, it's really hard. And maybe it wasn't in 12, um, but in the last five years, that's not the case anymore. Several vineyards have come online. Um, and prices are, are going down, um, whereas you know five years ago, oh, they're only going to keep going up, up, up. And and so I think it's been interesting to see. Um, I, I I don't I, I don't know the people that were telling us that I don't, I don't know what they were thinking. Maybe they just didn't realize how much was was coming online or would be coming online. But um, so I think from that perspective, that's been interesting to see how many more people are growing um, and um, and putting grapes out on the market and, and it seems like every time I turn around there's somebody else oh I want to have a vineyard <laughs> like maybe you should look into filberts <laughs> um, but yeah it's been um, that's been a real interesting thing just from from a market perspective that I think a lot of people got into vineyards maybe 10 years ago um, or 15 years ago and thought, oh, they were going to cash out and that really, more of them got into it than they all realized and so it hasn't really been the big cash cow that I think people thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so from a sourcing perspective, um, there's certainly a lot more grapes out there and there's certainly, there's, you know, the economy's good right now. People have cash and um, if people want to have a label, they can have a label and they can buy grapes and you know that's I think that's one reason we have 732 wineries in the state right now is you know it's a lot easier right now in the good times to, to get into this and so um, what do I see for the future I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens the next time we have an economic correction it'll be interesting to see what happens with all these new vineyards and new labels um, and I you know I don't know I, it'll be it'll be interesting to see where the market goes here in the valley but yeah hmm. and then you guys have kind of like um, gone around this question a little bit but um, not many people start completely from scratch anymore making their winery and planting a yep. vineyard and doing that whole thing <laughs> that's kind of a, um, a dream for some people that they end up just buying something that's already been made what advice do you have for people that have that dream and want to start from scratch like you guys did <laughs> I, I, I say I better answer this question. <laughs> hazelnuts, go into hazelnuts or pot, go into pot. <laughs> I, I, honest, I honestly think that the biggest thing is when you start, you know, ask people that have done this a lot of questions and listen to them because they've done this, they fought the battles, they will teach you how to avoid the toughest battles and to save money. I mean, that. That's one of the biggest things that, that we can point to specifically as benefits. We have not made any mistakes that have been crippling yeah. financially. I mean, we've made plenty of mistakes, oh, yeah. but none of which have been crippling. And we have heard a lot of stories from folks that have made exactly those crippling mistakes. And um, that's one thing you just can't afford to do. Um, and yeah. then keep it simple and understand your limitations um, you know I, I think that's something both Sarah and I have, have done very well um, you know we understand there are things that we're very good at and then there are things that we really need help with bring those people in and listen to what they say and just do it yeah. um, and get into it for the right reasons you are not going to get rich ever doing this no. but if it's your passion people will love you and they will come back yeah. it does work but you've, you, it, people will see it, and they will see it when your heart is into it. They will see it when your heart is not into it, um, and so will the rest of the industry. Yeah, yeah. I think you better have the the kind of winery that that you like. So mm -hmm. if you like doing weddings and special events, great, go do it, and tell me who you are because I'll send lots of people to you. I get calls all the time. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you, I mean, for us, we like being small. I mean, this is what we like to do. And, um, you know, we've had people that, you know, I, I guess are, they can't believe anybody would want to be this small. And <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we get that a lot. I mean, if your thing is you're a trust fund baby and you've got the money and you want a Marble Palace winery, go for it. You know, why not? Own it at least. But, but yeah, I think um, I think you really have to know what you want to do and be very confident in that, and not be swayed by what other people say. Um, and 
Um, you know, I know we've had um, Dave's winemaking style tends to be very um, gentle. He is not a heavy extraction, um, heavy tannin, heavy oak kind of maker. Um, and that's not everybody's style. And occasionally um, people don't get that and that's okay. Um, but that's what we're passionate about. That's the way we like. We like classic Oregon Pinot and that's what we're going to make. And that because that's what we like to drink and that's what we want. Um, to share with people and it's not everybody's cup of tea and we get that um, we are not um, but that's a great thing about being small yeah. we don't have to make wine for everybody make, no. we just have to make wine for for us the right people yeah and and then they'll keep coming back that right. that's the goal yeah um, we're not we're just you know this isn't I mean you can look around we're not a marble palace winery we call ourselves undomain um, <laughs> because we're just not uh, we're not pretentious we're not you know, the image buyer doesn't come here and that's totally fine. You know, we, we don't make wine for the 1% and that's, you know, that's a, a deliberate choice, but that's what we wanted to do. And that's what, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, yeah. So I think you have to really know who you are and what you want to be and stick with it and don't let other people try to convince you to be any other way. Um, so yeah, that would be what I would say. Yeah. 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 Well, that's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything else that you want to talk about that I should have asked that I didn't? I don't think so. No, you covered it. I mean, yeah. really, it's, I think. We had somebody ask, I had somebody ask me the other day, how have the two of you managed to do this without getting divorced? <laughs> um, and I think it's, you know, that, that their comment was, you know, I've been married 17 years and, you know, I've never even been able to paint a wall with my husband without, a, you know, a major disagreement. And, I, you know, I think um, in, in our case, we have a lot of respect for each other's strengths and um, we're willing to listen to oh, each other. Oh, thank other's. you, dear. Yeah, I do. <laughs> but it's the first time I've ever heard that one. Yeah, probably, whatever. So now it's documented for posterity. <laughs> um, but we do have a lot of respect for each other's strengths and we know, you know, when to stay out of each other's way. And we know, you know we, we had a disagreement the other day, um, but we compromised on it. And I think... <laughs> yes, we compromised. We did what she wanted. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so it was good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I think that's true. I mean, it, it, it's in a ways like any other working relationship yeah. that you're going to have with anybody. I mean, we're around each other. We're also raising a child, so we have that to deal with as well. Um, and and I think that's you, that's exactly right. You you have to have respect for each other. You're going to disagree. I mean, both of us have, both of us are stubborn. Mm -hmm. um, we have strong opinions, and we we think that you know when when we get an idea in our heads, we think that we're right about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think what helps is that there is a point where though we, we open our ears and we listen yeah. to each other and you know we, we take you know we take that old Benjamin Franklin quote about doubting our own infallibility yeah. and you know yeah. we kind of take a step back and said, does she have a point? Right. Sometimes no. Yeah. But most <laughs> most often yes. And wow. and you know when and when you kind of realize that, that's when you have to say, okay, and live to fight another day. Well and I would say too, you know, it's that that when we are at a stalemate with something with regard to the winery, whatever it is, we always have this deep well of like mentors that you know, we can say, you know what? Okay, we're not going to get, we can't agree on this. We need a mediator. This. We need a mediator. We need a third party. But no, like it's, I'm sure somebody else has had this argument with their business partner too. Mm -hmm. Let's call so-and-so and see what they say. And so I would say having that network of, of trusted mentors that you can ask anything yeah. um, and they will give you, you know, the straight, you know, because actually just about everybody that's ever mentored us, we have said, by the way, there is a degree of marital counseling involved in this. <laughs> um, and, and so that's, you know, they, they take that seriously. Most of the businesses that we have modeled ourselves after are pretty much typically husband and wife, um, you know, or, you know, maybe one of them is more involved than the other. But it, yeah, that's been a big, you know, that's often a comment that, you know, we'll ask, you know, how did that business decision impact your marriage? You know, that's something we ask people. And, and I would say that's been, um, that's been really good. So yeah, I would say too, if you're considering doing this with your spouse, <laughs> it's helpful to, to have some other um, folks to weigh in and, and give you that sanity check and you know, be the person to blame if it screws up, you know, doesn't work out. Well, we did what you told us and it didn't work. It's his fault, not ours. So, yeah. So that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much.